There you go. Excellent. Yeah. So, Joe, you know what? After our conversation of what you wanted and what I had to offer, this is going to be like a, a practical nutrition approach to coronary heart disease, okay? But it's going to spread out some other issues too, some other diseases too, later on, as you'll see. Uh, because I think when you try to implement this uh, with a patient, um, number one, is probably very difficult for them to sometimes comprehend, although it seems very simple. Number two, it can be very expensive for them and therefore make it prohibitive. Uh, so you have to be more practical on how you're going to get the message across to them that it's something they can actually do. Because most people, I, it sounds good, Doc, but I can't do it for various and sundry reasons. So as you got to find out, um, there are places in the world, because we're really talking about health and wellness, okay, whether it be cardiac health and wellness or just overall health and wellness, because if you, if you're over, if you have overall health and wellness, your heart's working well too. Uh, and there are certain places in the world right now that have been found where uh, centurions are really uh, a large part of the population. Uh, now, it's not everywhere for sure. I mean, the average lifespan in the United States were not 78.2 years. But there are places where you can see centurions not infrequently. Uh, and I'm gonna share those places with you. Uh, and I got this from a guy who came to uh, Louisiana College here in Alexandria in Pineville, oh, I guess about four or five years ago. His name is Dan Butner. And Dan, Dan shared with us, some of the audience may be familiar with this, Blue Zones areas where people uh, did certain things. He came up with nine ways to live uh, that promoted health and wellness. So when you're doing these nine things, your heart is benefiting from it. Your immune system is benefiting from it. Your lungs are benefiting from it. Your brain is benefiting from these things. Uh, but at the same time, inadvertently, it is incorporating some of these nutritional supplements and, uh, that we're going to be talking about without them maybe even knowing it. Uh, and therefore, they benefit from the uh, nutrition as a lifestyle rather than as a diet uh, for long periods of time. So with, with that said, we have to look at what, what's the problem. Let's move, Vicky. Can you hit the keys on the arrow? The uh... There you go. We got it. So I mean, as we all know, coronary disease or heart disease is very prevalent in the United States. Uh, we have about 610,000 people die of from heart disease. That's overall. But as you can see from coronary heart disease, which is the most common type of heart disease, about 370 people die annually from that. Okay, But every year, so it's 735,000 Americans have a heart attack. Wow. And 525 was the first heart attack. The other 210,000 is the second heart attack. So uh, you know, it's a very prevalent problem. And it's one I can actually tell you that I think with some uh, 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 guidance to the patient, uh, that this could be decreased significantly. But when you still have a country that's allowing cigarettes to be utilized, and I'm going to start talking about things that are legal but lethal. See, it's legal, but it's lethal. We're going to have something that's not legal and not lethal. Uh, but right now, cigarettes are one of those things that is legal, but lethal. And that's how our country let this thing go forward. There's no actual uh, medical uh, benefit from being uh, addicted to cigarettes. Patients talk about, well, I have to have my cigarette because it, it calms me down. No, you're getting down off your habit because you are addicted. So again, this is lethal, I mean, legal, but lethal. So there's some things we can certainly do to decrease this almost immediately. But for political reasons, not medical reasons, but for political reasons, we don't, we don't have our choice. We have a freedom of choice. And you see how sort of hypocritical later on in our conversation, but freedom of choice to, I want my cigarettes, I want my cigarettes. So um, again, there are certain things that we can do that will allow us to decrease this almost instantaneously over, I'm sure, over the next five to 10 years if we wanted to, but politically, that's not happening. Those areas I was talking about earlier that Dan Butner found, it's all over the world, different places. And uh, they have different some of lifestyle, but they do share some things in common. I'm gonna talk about that later too. So there's one place in Sardinia, Italy, Greece, western coast of Costa Rica, 
Seventh-day Adventists, mainly in Loma Linda, California area, a good friend uh, over there, Dr. Bailey and his colleagues, in Okinawa, Japan. They have large populations of centurions here because they have adapted a lifestyle. I think any time people start talking about diet, see, diet means I'm going to go on the diet, I'm coming off the diet. Well, that's not going to be beneficial for the long run. You have to have a lifestyle change. This is what I do. This is how I do things. I'm not doing it for a month. I'm doing it for a lifetime. So you have lifestyle changes. So how and why are these people uh, doing so well? Um, is be- and we're going to talk about it a little bit later too. But they have low incidence of diabetes. These are the risk factors for coronary heart disease. We all know these. Diabetes, smoking, high blood pressure, family history. Although the Danish study only shows that 20%, only 20% of coronary heart disease is genetically caused. I have patients all the time say, well, it runs in my family. Heart disease runs in my family. But when you sit down and really question them, well, why is it running in your family? You find out that because they're still doing the same thing that grandmother did 50 years ago. I'm still eating high fat foods. I am eating carbohydrates like in drinking water. I don't exercise. You know, I, uh, I do the same thing. So it's not really genetic. It is definitely environmental. Uh, but they get played off as a uh, genetics. Then obviously the diet. That is extremely important. You can't get around it. Uh, but again, it's not the only thing. You have to incorporate into a lifestyle that incorporates good diet, nutrition, with exercise. So uh, these are some of the things we'll be talking about tonight. So diabetes, well-known cause of coronary heart disease. Worldwide prevalence, 66% of American adults are overweight. 66% of Americans are overweight. I'm going to say it again. 66% of Americans are overweight. So, if we got attacked today, we couldn't even run from our enemy, okay? They're going to catch us. We can't even run. We don't run. So, I mean, you know, that is a big problem. And with that comes the onset of uh, type 2 diabetes. Here's a more, even more disturbing fact is that 33% of our American children are overweight, okay? We start to see diseases in our young people, especially coronary disease, that we didn't see into people in their 60s, 70s, 80s. Now we've seen it 40s and 50s and 60s. You know, that disease has now grasp a younger age group and it's going to make them uh, have to deal with it, whether it be from a medicine standpoint or surgical standpoint, but it's certainly going to be a disability for them to carry. Um, so, I mean, this is a very huge problem. Hyperglycemia, insulin resistance, which diabetes it causes micro and macrovascular disease. I mean, people go blind with diabetes, as we well know from the uh, microvascular problems and then coronary disease you know, peripheral arterial disease. Um, and then, like I said earlier, the obesity factor. So these are all things that are nutritionally uh, dependent. We talk, talked about serious smoking already. You know, that's a well-known cause of uh, coronary heart disease, cause intimal damage, but it causes cancer. I mean, Dr. Oshner, Alton Oshner, back in 19, early 20s, he told a story about how his professor asked him to come down to the pathology lab, because he had a case he wanted to show him. And this is off the subject about heart disease, but show how people would keep these addictions. And what he showed was one of the first cases of lung cancer. And it was actually for one of the dual boys who came back from World War One because they were given cigarettes. Then they got addicted. Now here comes the first case of lung cancer. You may not ever see one again. Well, not only you see one, he saw hundreds, thousands, all the way down the road, okay? We were still seeing it today. But now, it's in women too. It also causes heart disease. It causes intimal damage, oxidation, okay? And then we come back with the repair of this with the cholesterol. So uh, it's a known risk factor. It's still that, you know, so my point about Dr. Oxford was he, he said in 1935 in the pharmacology book that cigarette smoking is harmful to your health. We had guys testifying in Congress that cigarette smoking is safe as eating a Twinkie. Well, Twinkie's not that great either, you know, but they did it anyway. Uh, so cigarette smoking, heart disease, lung cancer, very well known. We're still doing it. High blood pressure, again, well known a risk factor for coronary heart disease. Um, and control uh, high blood pressure, we've seen decrease just of heart disease and stroke. But patient compliance is important. You know, there's a social uh, implication with uh, uh, these things. So they want to not follow the diet. The DASH diet is out to help with high blood pressure but our patients continue to be non-compliant. Um, family history, I talked about it earlier, how only 20% is genetically caused. It's environmental more than it is genetic. 
we talk about diet, you know, there are different types of diet. I can go through very a number of them. I think the audience is probably very familiar with several low carbohydrate, low fatty diets. But when you think about it, and I always tell the story of this patient I had. Uh, in fact, I never saw his brother today. Uh, the gentleman came, he's about six foot three, weighed 300 pounds, and uh, I did a three vessel bypass on him. Did great. Uh, I didn't see him again for about two months. He came back, he had lost almost 75 pounds. Now, you know, I do weight loss counseling and things, but I've never seen anybody lose that much weight that fast. So I asked his wife, I said, what did you do? So I made him eat one time. So he made him eat one time, what do you mean? She said, well, he was eating three times at night time, so I made, had him eat just one time. So a lot of our problem is not what we're eating, it's how much we're eating. I mean, we eat a lot of food in America. The average woman just needs 2,000 calories per day to maintain good health. And men need about 2,500. I guarantee you, if you said I take an inventory of a daily food intake, a lot of us are way over that number. Probably in the foot. <laughs> you volunteer, Joe? Yeah, I, know. I know I'm over. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure I'm sure we all have a problem. We go to New Orleans, you got to get over, over that, that number. But I think on a daily basis, the average is 3,000, 4,000 calories a day. But you can't burn that many calories a day. So it builds up as excess fat, whatever. And it brings on diabetes. You know, brings on heart disease. So it's a cascade of things that takes you down that, that road that you can do away with. And if you don't think this is a problem, uh, here's a, a slide I got from the CDC that shows the incidence of obesity as it changed from 1986 up into uh, I think the early uh, 2000s. As you notice, the states are going to get darker. As they get darker, they turn into maroon. The incidence of obesity is increasing, you know. Uh, there's a lot of things you can say that started this problem, you know, creating all these couch potatoes, uh, the internet, people on phones, you see children on phones, they, 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 they say they video it, but they're not playing. You know, they're playing these games on the video, but not really playing to sweat. So they, they develop this, this sickness, I call it, of uh, not uh, benefit from true healthful things. So as you can see now, it's 2003, and the states are really getting dark. You can notice the southern states always turn it first. You know, they go lose in Mississippi, over 30 percent, uh, and this is a patient being obese. So I mean, it's it's a national problem. But what I want to show you here pretty soon, you're gonna see it as this as these numbers increase. It also that's 2010, so it's eight years ago. It also goes in direct correlation. Notice where the dark redness on the calendar is, on the states are, to the incidence of heart disease. <clears throat> Still in the southern belt, you can see where we are, Joe, right in the middle of Louisiana. We're right in the middle of the boot right there. High incidence of obesity, high incidence of uh, coronary heart disease. So there's a good correlation there. Also, so again, so it's with diet, lack of exercise. Notice the western states, not so much. So what is the real problem? The real problem is very simple. There's two complex uh, entities that we can attack as well as treat. And I'll get to that later too on what I'm thinking about that, but it's inflammation and oxidation. These are the two entities that causes the damage internally, especially on our arteries, that then become repaired okay, by uh, Foam cells, cholesterol causes the plaque and causes the blockage. Therefore, it causes ischemia in certain different areas, whether it be the brain for stroke, heart for heart attack, the legs for the gangrene and uh, uh, claudication. So inflammation, oxidation. And I think everybody understands what these are, but just to go over real quick, okay? Um, you think about oxidation, <clears throat> you think about... Um, Throwing a pair of pliers out in the front yard, just leave my there for two weeks. When you come back, you know they're going to be rusted. That rust is oxidation, okay? So uh, this is what happens inside our bodies when we do things like cigarette smoking, high fatty diets, high carbohydrate diets, no exercise. Um, we start to rust on the inside, so to speak. That rust in our system is called plaque, okay? So as we do this, it accumulates. Now we're having disease in these blood vessels. Again, whether it's the eyes, the carotid arteries for stroke, the heart, or the lower extremities for peripheral arterial disease. So there's oxidation. And I, like I said earlier, we start to see it in younger and younger patients. 
uh, who we didn't see before. I mean, I've been this practice. I just celebrated my 40th year graduate from medical school. Wow. So over those 40 years, I've seen this progression backwards of disease. So instead of us getting rid of disease, it's being developed uh, in younger and younger patients. Um, I'm sort of a, 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 a theorist that I think there's a reason behind this whole thing. I, I always tell my people, sometimes I'm going to write a book about the, the, uh, the uh, food industry and medicine working together to cause these problems, keep them in that circle, you know, keep them going. Uh, but oxidation, what happens right there, inflammation, again, is a damage it's happening to inside the body when it's exposed to some type of foreign materials. Now, in this situation, it could be viruses. It could be, again, high just proteins from foods that we're eating. But it's inflammation takes place. It causes damage on the inside of our bodies. And it causes injury, blood vessels, again, being repaired or attempt to be repaired by uh, cholesterol and causing blockages and uh, uh, then stroke, heart attack, uh, peripheral vascular disease. So when you talk about nutritional supplements, Joe, for a long time, so we knew these problems were going on. We talked about, is there a way for us to deal with this from a supplement standpoint to eradicate these problems very easily without um, uh, having to go to very extreme circumstances where there be medicines that have side effects, a surgery that can have complications. Now, with that said, now obviously there have been a lot of great things developed medically and surgically that benefit a, a lot, a lot of people. Okay. With that said, though, I still believe that we can still do better uh, if we put our emphasis in the right places. Uh, but it has to happen both uh, from a medical as well as a political uh, arena. Uh, so there's been much controversy about the need for supplements. There's no doubt in certain instances this is necessary. And there's a long history of supplements, deficiency diseases. Now, this history of deficiency diseases lets us know that as we don't have access or we don't have these Nutri nutritional supplements in our bodies, bad things are going to happen. Okay? Bad things are going to happen. And I'll start off with vitamin C. I think everybody knows the story of vitamin C with the British sailors and how they'd be on these long journeys. And before the journey was completed, they started having a lot of problems. Uh, as you can see, here's the, some of the stages of scurvy on the screen. Lethargy and fatigue, bleeding gums, anemia, high fever, in delirium. Uh, but when they would land on these uh, paradise islands and they got to eat some fruit and uh, vegetables, they got cured. They didn't know why, though. But it automatically those symptoms went away. Later went on to find out that it was because of the vitamin C. And the British Navy then made it necessary to put lines on the ships such that the sailors had access to vitamin C. So that's how they got the name Alimius. The British service is known as Alimi. Um, now, I'm going to tell you now, that was, that was obviously a deficiency. But there's still undetected cases of vitamin C deficiency. Vitamin C is a very powerful antioxidant. And I can guarantee you that we don't get enough in our daily diet. People don't eat fruits and vegetables like they should. Uh, I have patients who I've never eaten a fruit or vegetable. And you have heart disease at 40 years old. Now I know, you know why. Uh, so the undetected cases of vitamin C deficiency that could benefit from people eating fruits and vegetables would be the best thing. Whole food supplements would be the best thing. But if not, supplementing with uh, vitamin C. Okay? A uh, daily dose of vitamin C has a similar effect of walking on a protein called endothelium 1, which promotes constriction of small blood vessels. So if the endothelium 1 makes your blood vessels constrict, okay, so if you walk, if you take vitamin C, walking makes endothelial one less prevalent. So you don't have vasoconstriction, okay? The blood vessels open up, they dilate. Vitamin C has the same effect. So it's a very beneficial vitamin. Uh, again, eat whole food in all my things, I'm telling you, whole food is always better because there's an entourage effect in the um, foods that we don't realize that was put there, I mean, an apple has 10,000 phytochemicals. You know, you can't just pull out one thing out of the apple and say, this is great. No, all those 10,000 phytochemicals were put there for a reason, okay? And when you eat the whole apple, it does keep the doctor away. So, I mean, you know, those are the kind of things that we don't realize. So, whole food something is always better. So, again, vitamin C. Uh, if you look at a chart of as vitamin C 
uh, went from the hunter-gatherer stage, agriculture, now the industrial age, you look at the, the years down at the bottom, our vitamin C levels have gone down, so is our vitamin E levels, total fat has gone up, saturated fats have gone up, trans fats have gone up, but what I didn't have, to, I couldn't find a slide to put on there, that all these, as the vitamins went down, and all these other fats and things went up, so did heart disease, you know, a direct correlation. So as our diets changed, okay, so did our disease patterns, okay, and it's directly related to diet. Here's another one that everybody saw for me, vitamin D. Talking about deficiencies, deficiency syndromes, okay. Everybody realized vitamin D was caused by rickets. We have the bow legs, okay. What people don't realize is that vitamin D was something of the, you know, the sunshine vitamin. Uh, get out of the sunshine, your vitamin D level goes up. Um, but vitamin D has also been shown to be a hormone. And it's definitely shown to help prevent coronary heart disease. Okay? It helps promote your immune system as well, too. So again, a deficiency in this one vitamin can cause these problems. Right now, we have 77% of Americans are vitamin D deficient. So anybody out there that goes to their family, family practice doctor needs to ask the doctor to check your vitamin D level. 77% of Americans are vitamin D deficient. It's very easy to supplement, get your vitamin D levels back up. Also associated with um, um, a psychosis. Uh, people say that's why I have a high rate of suicide up in the north because they don't have much sunshine. So uh, vitamin D. So we have a vitamin D deficient, but also hurts our hearts. Now, vitamin D has sort of got a bad rap. You know, it's a very powerful antioxidant. Uh, but there's some studies done, one by Dr. Eva Long up in Manchester and Hamilton, Ontario, that said that supplementing with vitamin E uh, didn't benefit the patient, actually may have caused some harm. The one thing I have about that study was the first thing, they used a low level of vitamin O, only 400 international units a day. You gotta have to take more vitamin E than that, like around 1,000 international units a day. Plus, again, like I'm gonna say, coming from whole fruits and vegetables, the vitamin E in those uh, 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 plants would help you boil because of the entourage effect of everything working together. Vitamin E doesn't work really well together with selenium. So you have to have vitamin E with selenium to get some benefit from it. One of my big ones is a story I always tell about coenzyme Q10. When I came here 30 years ago, I was talking about coenzyme Q10. Nobody knew what I was talking about. I thought it was like uh, a witch hunt or something. Uh, but now you can't turn on TV. Somebody's trying to sell coenzyme Q10. Uh, again, it's an antioxidant. Your body produces it naturally. Uh, but over time, you start to produce less. Okay? But your mitochondria needs coenzyme Q10 to generate ATP. You know, it's to be the energy your whole body needs, but certainly your heart cells functioning to be healthy. Okay? Like I said, levels of coenzyme Q10 decrease as your body decreases with age. Okay? As you take coenzyme Q10, especially people can just heart failure, you benefit from that. It's also been shown that people taking statins now uh, benefit from being on coenzyme Q10 because it's associated the low levels as you take a statin, your coenzyme Q levels, levels even go on further, even 50%. So you get the myopathy. So you got to take coenzyme Q10. Very powerful antioxidant. But here's one I like to tell this story too glutathione. Very powerful antioxidant, if not our most powerful antioxidants. Essential to cell survival. A deficient cardiac and systemic glutathione release because it's heart failure. There's a story about this guy. He was from Greece. He was in America in the 60s, maybe the late 50s. And uh, he had a uh, debilitating disease. His doctor told him he was going to die uh, soon. So with that knowledge, he said, well, I want to go back home and be with my family. So he went back to Greece. Year passed, he hadn't died yet. Five years, he hadn't died yet. Ten years, he died. 30 years later, he still hadn't died. He came back to America to tell his doctor he was still living. Well, his doctor had died. Okay? <laughs> So, if you went and look at it, he was eating a stuff called purslane, which is a Greek plant that's high in glutathione, uh, produce, helps produce glutathione. They eat it in everything. Salads, any meats they do, it's everywhere, like our lettuce. Uh, but uh, he benefited from having the glutathione levels increase it. Again, helps with the energy production, ATP, uh, and he was lived a long, healthy life after that. Again, that's in Greece, the area I was talking about earlier for one of those blue zone areas. Curcumin. Uh, this is the polyphenol responsible for the yellow color and the curse spice uh, turmeric. Good anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, anti-carcinogenic, anti-thrombotic, and cardiovascular protective effects. 
Okay? One of those things you need to have in your diet. It can attenuate adriamycin induced cardiotoxicity. Okay? And it can prevent cardiovascular complications. Again, one of those nutrients and supplements that you need to have in your diet. Here's another one that's come out recently that say that if you don't have enough NAD, uh, you're going to have a problem. It impacts your cardiovascular system directly and indirectly. It also modulates whole body metabolism. Now, this is the thing I really want to emphasize. As your whole body is doing better, so is your heart, so is your brain, so is your lungs, so is your liver. Whole body metabolism. And that's extremely important. How does it do that? It does the endothelial nitric oxide synthase. Nitric oxide, we'll talk about it later too, is one of those, again, nutrients that you have to have. Here it is right here. Nitric oxide. Nitric oxide, actually, uh, one, I can't remember the doctor's name right now, won a Nobel Prize for nitric oxide not too long ago. Uh, it found nitric oxide has a lot of positive things. Uh, and uh, I, I, sometimes I really believe if we were to uh, potentiate us developing people with more nitric oxide in their bodies, we would get rid of a lot of problems. Nitric oxide expands the blood vessels, increases blood flow, decreases plaque growth. Extremely important. Decreases plaque growth. Again. Not too many things can say that. Okay? And blood clotting. It helps with erectile dysfunction. If anybody doesn't realize, nitric oxide is what Viagra works with. Okay? And Cialis. Okay? So I tell my people all the time that everybody should be taking Viagra and Cialis pretty soon. Heart disease. They already use it for pulmonary arterial uh, hypertension. You know? For vasodilatation. So it's being used already in the cardiovascular area, but not for coronary disease to get rid of plaque, open up blood vessels, and the like. It's a gas in our system, so you can't really take it as a gas. You have to take the precursors to the nitric oxide. Where can you get uh, a lot of uh, precursors to that? It would be in dark chocolate, not milk chocolate, dark chocolate, citrus, pomegranates, walnuts, arugula, spinach, watermelon, and beets in particular. Matter of fact, there's a company that sells a beet powder you can take. I can tell you I drink it every morning. Uh, but again, to increase your nitric oxide levels uh, in your body. That's a very important. But again, the, the, it, you can do all this preaching if you want to, Joe, but if the patient does not become compliant, uh, you preach to the, you know, you, you just, it's not going to do any good. Uh, like I said, life expectancy for America today is 78.2 years. But this year, over 70,000 Americans reached the age of 100. So what are they doing that most Americans are? Uh, not doing or won't do, okay? And I emphasize more on won't do. Uh, they can complain about the government and whatever, but like I tell you all, when you go to the grocery store, I don't see anybody standing behind you from the government saying, uh, you need to buy all that bacon. Uh, you need to go get all those cookies. Uh, you need, there's nobody, that, it's a choice you have to make. You have a choice. So it exercise that choice uh, as, as, as you go shopping, Okay. So again, with compliance, I talked about lifestyle changes, not diet. So all those things we talked about uh, are very important. But if you don't implement as a lifestyle change, uh, it's not you're not gonna benefit in the long run because you can't do it on Wednesday and Thursday. I'm gonna think about it two weeks from now. It has to be an everyday occurrence, which is what these people in these areas do in the blue zone areas that we talked about earlier. So they have incorporated a lifestyle that they do things that they normally do. It's not, it's, not a, it's not going out the way to do this for them. This is what they live, how they live, okay? So there were nine things that they did, or they do, I'm sorry, they do, that they benefit from. And what is they move naturally? They don't have exercise gym. The sheep herder in, in Sardinia, he walks about five miles a day herding sheep. That's his job, okay? But a lot of his friends had the same job. So therefore, uh, he benefited from that way. Now, obviously, these areas live in a, in a, in a uh, simpler lifestyle area, okay? But it shows that the exercise does work, okay? He has a purpose. He wakes up in the morning, he's got a purpose. Whether it's I'm taking care of my family, I'm doing something for friends, whatever. It's not like I'm lost, I don't know what to do. He has a purpose, okay? They know how to downshift by taking it easy. Stress, you know, we'll put uh, some, some uh, bad things on you, whether it be increased adrenaline, Make your heart rate faster, uh, cortisol levels, uh, increase your glucose levels in your body. So they know how to downshift. So we want people to downshift. You, you listen to the website on LECBT, we talk about yoga, meditation, and prayer. Whatever it was fits for you, that's what you need to do to downshift. And you need to do it every day. 
Okay. What is the 80% rule? This comes from the, the uh, people in Okinawa. They developed it's called Hari Hachibu, is what they call it, Hari Hachibu. What it means is when you go to dinner, you only eat 80% of the food. So we've been about to clean that food off, eat everything, you know, till you feel. Well, they don't believe that. Uh, they eat 80% of the food. They don't eat the whole plate. Um, and we might want to say, let's get a smaller plate. That'd be good too. But when you have those, those 12 inch plates and they fill it out to the brim, um, think about eating only 80% of it, okay? Now, another thing they do, again, that's nutritional, and they benefit from, is they have a plant, uh, slant on the type of food they eat. So if I ask Americans right now, think of this, I'm gonna say one name, and the first thing that comes to your mind, I'm, I'm not gonna answer tonight, I know, but what happens is when I say this one word, this is the, this is the natural thing everybody comes to, and I'm gonna say it right now, Thanksgiving. Turkey. If, if you didn't think about a turkey, <clears throat> you see, you didn't get the right answer. So you got the right answer, Joe, you did good. All right. Uh, <clears throat> so we have a turkey and we build a dinner around that. Well, in these areas, they don't have a turkey. They build up food around the plants that they have. They have meat around it. So they have a plant slat to their diet. Actually, they eat about four ounces of meat, maybe two or three times a week. That's about a deck of cards. Uh, four ounces, about a deck of cards. So four ounces of meat, about um, uh, two or three times a week is what they can consume. They do, they're not teetotalers, except for the, the seven day Adventists. Those are the only ones who are teetotal. They do drink wine. So they benefit from the, the polyphenols, the resveratrol in the wine, okay? But they don't overdo it, okay? Teetotalers and people overdo alcohol are the ones who get hurt. Uh, they're in the middle, one to two drinks a day, mainly wine. The group in Sardinia has a special wine that's called Canano, okay? Canano. Matter of fact, I got, I got uh, one of the local wine dealers here in town to stock that so I can send my pictures over they can get it at the, at, the, at the place in town. You go to your wine people expert too. It's called Canano from Sardinia, Italy. Okay? They put loved ones first. Okay? Uh, they don't send the old folks off to the nursing home. They keep them there, take care of them. And usually they live in a long time. They still can work. They have things they can do for the family. They're very helpful. Okay? Um, uh, the shift belong. In other words, they're still keeping that thing with family. The, uh, the Okinawans, they have a tribe, a, a group of people that when, from the time you were born, that's your group. That's your support group until the time you die. So you have these friends all the way through. I can tell you right now, I don't have uh, 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 four friends from childhood that call on the telephone right now, and that's my fault. Uh, but they do that. That's another big thing. And it being the right tribe. Again, the whole thing about having a purpose, being with family and the like. So all these things together. So if I tell you right now, take vitamin C, you're gonna live forever, that's not gonna happen. Take vitamin D, you're gonna live forever, not gonna happen. It's a more consuming lifestyle that you're gonna need to benefit from it. And you want healthy lifestyle. So we talk about nutrition and heart disease, it's more than that. Your heart's have to be happy and it can be healthy. So, uh, but at the same time, you can't be happy and smoke cigarettes, eat donuts, don't exercise, whatever. That's going to be unhappy heart, uh, whatever. So, and then, so I'm going to tell you, you have to inventory your lifestyle. Take those nine things, inventory your lifestyle, and see where you are on the uh, uh, map as far as keeping yourself healthy and uh, happy. And you'll have a happy heart. So I think you want to stop me here, Joe, for a little break. So, yes. Yeah, so, well, let's get into some, some discussion um, Jennifer Warner, a uh, perfusionist whom I've known for uh, uh, at least the past 12 years, said, uh, so, Dr. Jones, working in the operating room is basically going to kill me. No sun, no natural movement, high stress, and no wine at work. If you live in an operating room like that, the answer to that question is yes. Uh, again, you have to make the effort to Build in some time for yourself. Extremely difficult. I can tell you, I'm fighting it all the time myself. Um, but it's necessary. Um, mm -hmm. Stress in the operating room, donuts in the doctor's lounge, the soft drinks there, the no sunlight. Yeah, that's deleterious to our health. Mm -hmm. So you have to make time to uh, go out. There's one doctor I'm reading right now. He talks about getting your circadian clock always in sync. And to do that, you have to be outside in the daylight time to get some sun. Mm -hmm. if, you don't that, if you don't do that, your circadian clock is not going to be timed right. Mm -hmm. So it's very, just, you have to, it's an effort. 
You know, it's everything. You have to, I mean, you have to do it. Well, you know, and then that brings up, I think that, that, that that's a very good point. But we are in, and I, and I remember early on in your presentation, you did sound a little conspiratorish thinking uh, thought process, which, you know, Roger's sitting over there and I'm, I'm watching him shaking his head in an affirmation because he is a big time conspiracy theorist of every conspiracy you can imagine. Um, and, uh, but with that said, you know, our, ex the expectations of society, our employers, um, the, uh, the, the, who, who, whether they're direct employers or you are servicing a company, whatever it might be, the expectations are that you will be there before the sun comes up and you will stay here long after the sun has gone down because we have all of this work to do. And, you know, yes, it, it is a personal responsibility, but has our society not evolved or devolved, whichever you want to look at it, into a state of that is no longer respected or considered important? I think you're right about that. But, you know, when you look at companies like, and I'm, I'm saying this, I've read about this, I haven't experienced it myself, I've seen it myself, uh, companies like Google and Yahoo and those places who put these play things in, in place for the people at work, these gyms at the place for people at work. The daycare for their children, so they can bring their children to worry about the kids. Uh, there are some companies that are uh, on the on the forefront of, uh, of acknowledging that the work has got to be happy mm -hmm. and healthy. Mm -hmm. And you see, they get a very productive output uh, from those uh, workers uh, by the uh, fact that they're some of the leading biggest companies in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amazing hospitals, the, the supposed to be the vanguard for health. Hadn't really caught on to that too much. Mm -hmm. And and okay, yeah, that, that's true. In fact, a lot of you know, yes, Google is a humongous organization. You know, Amazon is a humongous organization. I I get that, but you know, in many cities, hospitals are the largest employer, mm -hmm. and you know, so one would think that what you're saying would have already resonated. And so, you know, I'll, I'll challenge you to ask, when is it going to become mainstream accepted that the people who work in these high stress environments, whether they're heart surgeons, perfusionists, CRNAs, anesthesiologists, uh, scrub, scrub techs, um, auto transfusionists, whatever, um, have to, are, 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 are basically shortening their life because of their job. So when's that going to happen? And how does it happen? And what can we do as individuals in a society to help to uh, 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 stimulate that to happen? Yeah, well, I'm going to talk about one of the things I think that can help a little bit later. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, it becomes a political and a financial thing. I think unless it becomes expedient <clears throat> for the entity, whether it be a hospital, a business, to them, uh, then we're probably not going to see it too soon. Well, you have taught me a couple of things. I remember going around with you uh, uh, when I was working with you, and uh, on your higher risk patients, you would start them on coenzyme Q10 and a couple of other things with a cocktail before you took them to the operating room in uh, 24 to 48 hours. So, right. you know, can you can you elaborate a little bit on that, and are you still doing that? And do you have you anecdotally seen benefit? Oh, I'm definitely. I been like said, I've been doing that for over you know 30 years. Um, actually, I got the idea from Noel Mills, who was a fantastic surgeon down in New Orleans. Yeah, did your mom's surgery? Yeah, that's right. That's, right, exactly. that's right. Six vessels. Yeah, By 1989. Yeah, and lasted did 20 years. Yeah, 20. Yeah, she never had another thing. Never had another cardiac uh, cath. Never had another echo. She broke her hip and died at 87 from the complications of that. Her egg injection fracture was 65. percent mm Mm-hmm. Did she, she did she change her lifestyle after the heart disease? Yeah, well, she was diabetic, you know, been for a long time. So she got that more in control mm -hmm. and it, it helped a lot. Well, my brother-in-law is a doctor and she lived in the house, so that helped out too. So, sure. Uh, but my cocktail that I use, Joe, I call it 
in this, I call it my myocardial enhancement uh, package, okay? Now I call it my voodoo medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's a combination of things that when I see a myocardium in trouble, uh, from a low ejection fraction and been stunned, I want to give it something to boost it up. You know, and these things I know can do it because if we develop more ATP in the myocardium, that's what helps when we try to come off bypass. So mm -hmm. uh, one, I do things like it's coenzyme Q10, it's vitamin E, it's vitamin C, it's L-carnitine, oh. and I give some intralipids IV for fuel as well. 20% mm -hmm. intralipids. All right, Roger, okay. can you open the uh, the phone lines? I forgot yeah. to do that. Okay. I'm sorry, Dr. Jones. I just, we're going to put a message up. The phone lines are open. I forgot to do that, but go ahead. So can you give mm -hmm. that cocktail one more time? And I'm so sorry. Yeah, no problem. So I say it's coenzyme Q10, vitamin E, vitamin C, acetyl L-carnitine, and I get some IV intralipids. Okay, and I trade it for 24 to 48 hours. Again, as a uh, measure of boosting the, my, the metabolism inside the heart for generating ATP. Mm -hmm. uh, I got to tell you to date, Joe, uh, it might be somewhat anecdotal, uh, but uh, every patient I've given it to has done well. Mm -hmm. Well, that's important. I mean, I think anecdotal evidence is, is compelling. You know, especially, I mean, if, in my view anyway. So I had a, another couple of questions while we uh, wait until the signal goes through. There's a little delay, so it'll take about 30 or, or 60 seconds for people to see that the phone lines were opened. Um, can we talk a little bit about uh, can you overcome these bad habits if you don't change the bad habits with these supplements, in other words, if you're, you know, if you're, you're maybe, maybe, maybe minimize some of them a little bit. Let's say you're, let's say you're at a hundred of just bad diet, bad habits, but you also, you go down to like 90%, but you add these other things that you're talking about nutritionally. Yeah, it's not going to work. Not going to work? No. Not Hello, you're on the yeah. air. Yes, this is Adam Mertens from Columbia, Missouri. Hey, Adam Merton. Adam Merton from Columbia, Dr. Jones. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, How are you? Okay. Good. Um, I'm I'm curious as to the what would you consider to be the number one uh, contributor to high cholesterol? High cholesterol? That was the question. Mark. Yes. What would you consider to be the number one contributor to elevated cholesterol? Yeah, well, you know, there are many things out there that they've, they've, they've attributed to this, Adam. Uh, uh, and if you ever read a book called Sugar Busters many years ago by some doctors out of New Orleans, as a matter of fact, uh, I think they showed clearly that sugar and carbohydrates played a huge role in elevated cholesterol. I mean, we thought for a long time right. saturated fats. Now, saturated fats is, can do it too, but it appears right now that carbohydrates have a larger role in cholesterol elevation than saturated fats. Again, they're both bad players. I'm not trying to take light of saturated fats, but it's not as bad as we thought it was, uh, and it appears that it's carbohydrates. Interesting, thank you. Thanks, Adam. Hey. That's uh -huh. good, that was, that was really, in fact, I was, I was gonna ask you about sugar busters. So, yes. you know, what do you think of that diet now, 30 years after that book was written? That was, uh, I think that was, uh, um, what was that, Mobethay. Mobethe yeah, from uh, Baptist Hospital in New Orleans was one of the authors of that book. Yeah, I think you, I think you told you worked with him for a while. I well, one case. Okay, one case. Okay. Yeah, no, I think that again, Joe. That again, uh, sugar legal but lethal. Mm -hmm. Le legal. So, do you think lethal. it's a good diet? I mean, do you think yeah, that I it is a good versus a plant based plant slant diet that you described? Do you think sugar busters? independently is a good diet program. I think anything where you don't overdo carbohydrates is good. Mm -hmm. And sugar busters, that's what that was all about, is decreasing your carbohydrate load, understand the glycemic index, mm -hmm. and how to affect you, you know, whether you should eat white bread or, or not. Um, so, I mean, those those things are very important for us to understand at that time. I mean, mm -hmm. that was an eye opener. Uh, so, yes, I think that sugar busting is a good concept, but we still need some carbohydrates. We can't mm -hmm. do without carbohydrates, okay? Mm -hmm. It's a complex carbohydrate, whether they come from beans or whatever, uh, but it's a high fructose sugars that get us in trouble. Whether mm -hmm. they come from soft drinks or sugars or syrups or whatever, 
they get us in trouble all the time. Mm-hmm. So the buses was a, was an eye opener for us that we had to cut back on our carbohydrate intake to uh, not uh, feel the deleterious effect of having too much glucose and sugar and starches in our diet. Mm-hmm. So I have a question here um, from a person texting: Is it is the is the damage that occurs from um, acquired disease like CAD from diet and lifestyle from environmental uh, influences reversible? That's a very good question. And I'll, I'll give you a personal experience with that. Okay. I had a lady when I got here those many years ago, I did an emergency bypass operation on, and, uh, she did well for heart surgery. Uh, preoperatively she had a 70% carotid lesion that I thought I'd be had to fix later. Got her through the surgery. She came back to see me. And then we followed up for a while. Six months later, when we followed up, we repeated the, uh, she had lost the follow for a while. We repeated the, uh, the ultron of a carotid, and that 70% lesion now was 20%. Wow. Now, I, I, was, shocked. I was shocked, you know, and I, because I knew the first study was valid. It was done in our office, and she was, a uh, we have a good office sonographer. And so I just said, you know, and, she, and I know she had lost a lot of weight. And so I said, well, what did you do? And she told me she just, she started eating less. And that's a very important part, too. And I said it earlier. Sometimes now what we eat is how much we eat it. Okay? Mm-hmm. We overeat it. Okay? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, but she ate less. She lost the weight. So when you look at the dynamics of an arterial plaque, okay, it's not all calcium. It's not all fibrous tissue. That's a component, that's a component called foam cells. Foam cells are really monocytes. Okay? And they're dynamic. In other words, as you would have gone to a, a, a serious diet, you can make that plaque smaller. Mm-hmm. Now, if the plaque is just full of calcium and fiber tissue, you're not going to make that small. Mm-hmm. It's the consistency of the foam cells in the plaque that you do have opportunity to decrease that plaque if you're going to a serious diet. Mm-hmm. So that's as good. Yes, it can be reversible if it has the right uh, morpholo- morphology of the plaque. Okay, fair enough. So before we go to to break, let me just ask you to elaborate on one thing, but I'll also add these additional quick questions. One question is, where is my red perfweb.us cup? I will have that after the break. So, and then the other is, um, what's in the red solo cup? And it's iced tea. So uh, just so you know, it's iced tea. Good to know. Apparently, Dr. Jones wanted to, uh, somebody wanted to know that. Um, but with that said, listen, Dr. Jones, this has been, uh, I'm really looking forward to the cannabinoids. I think what we'll do is take a few minutes break, let you uh, stretch your legs a little bit, and then we'll come back uh, after about five minutes and uh, hit the, uh, the uh, talk on the cardiovascular benefits of cannabinoids. Sounds good. Sounds good. Thank you very much, sir. We'll go to five minute break.